Okay. okay. We're live. We're live. We're doing this, friends. Hello. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we'll talk about um, Kubernetes policies in Kubernetes, what we can do with them, and uh, maybe a bit of cross-plane. Um, I don't know what's happening on the screen. You will have to have a lot of imagination if you want to understand what <laughs> we're talking about without the slides. There we go. Um, there we go. So uh, it's two of us. My name is Victor. Uh, I do stuff. That's my presentation. And now we and uh, Whitney is going to introduce herself. Oh, look at me. I do stuff too. Uh oh. <laughs> I broke it. My face on there yeah. just broke the whole thing. I'm a I'm a relatively new speaker. I've been doing this for about a year. And so I still get shaky and nervous from, from doing this. So thank you already for being warm and friendly faces. And, uh, but Victor's been doing this for like 20 years, so you don't need to be nice to him about it. So <laughs> um, uh, do we yeah. have some technical friends who know that there's a problem with the slides right now? There you are. Aha! All right. Oh. It, uh, VMware appeared on a screen and that it shut down itself immediately. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm a developer advocate for VMware. There we go. There we go. That's me on Twitter. I do some things too, just like Victor. We both do things. Um, and. Okay. There's a screen. Oh, yeah. I, I can do this. Can. <laughs> What's, did you want to say something for the setup part? No, no, no. Just. No. Okay. You can go. Uh, I mean, you cannot go because you cannot see what's going on. But yeah. So we're going to be talking about what are uh, what is Kubernetes validating admission policy, and to understand that, we'll need to talk about what are Kubernetes controllers. But I'm just like trusting that this, the things are going to come onto the screen. There we go. Ah, we'll talk fast before it disappears. <laughs> go, 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 go. <laughs> so, to talk about what are Kubernetes uh, admission controllers, we're going to talk about what happens when you create a resource with the Kubernetes API. So, that's you or maybe some machine, and you've written a manifest and you want to apply it to the cluster to create a resource. The first thing that's going to happen is it's going to go through authentication and authorization layers. So, who are you and are you even allowed to make a resource here? Okay, you're allowed. So now we're going through our first set of admission controllers. The admission controllers at this point may um, have mutations. So the admission, uh, what's going to happen is webhooks are sent through to controllers and those controllers are going to look at your resource and they may or may not decide to change things. So one thing that might get changed, maybe service mesh will be added. So maybe a, a container will be added to every pod. That might get changed, or perhaps a tool like Kyverno is going to change your manifest before it gets applied to the cluster. So what that might do, maybe it's going to look for CPU and memory, and if it's not there, it might add that. So look at our little manifest. Bam, it just changed a little bit because we had a, a mutating admission controller. So. Now it makes sense to go to the next step, which is object schema validation. So now the API is looking, does the, the resource you define, does it match the schema of the resource or custom resource of the cluster? If so, now we're finally seeing a validating admission controller. So as long as there's been admission controllers in Kubernetes, they've been leveraged to do validations. And so here's where policy can be implemented. So is it, does it follow the policy that you've specified? And we'll talk more about that shortly, but assuming it does, it's still okay, that's when the resource finally gets written to etcd. And that, this whole process is gonna go through again and again, say we made a deployment. So now a replica set needs to get made and it's gonna go through this whole process and then pods need to get made and it's gonna keep happening until there are actually resources running on the cluster. So that's how that goes. So what then is Kubernetes validating admission policy? So it was that validating admission controller step that was kind of done um, third party tools, how, however they wanted to do it. Now we have a standardized way to do it that's baked into Kubernetes. 
How am I doing, Victor? Do you feel good about everything? If I would be listening, I would say you're doing great. <laughs> He's, he has me tuned out. But that's because he trusts me, not because he doesn't care. It's a little bit of both. Uh, <laughs> so here we have um, a validating admission policy. So this is now baked into Kubernetes. Ooh, you can see how badly I'm shaking from uh, adrenaline by the, the way this. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we've named this one demopolicy.example.com. And so what it's basically saying is it's looking for resources that match these rules. If you're creating or updating a deployment with the apps v1, then it's going to look at the expression. Is your replicas, is it less than or equal to five? And so if it passes the expression, then you get to make your resource. If it doesn't pass the expression, then it's going to look at the failure policy. And so here we have it set to fail, but you could maybe just give a warning or something and not completely fail it. Now here we don't if we make this resource, the problem is we don't know when to apply it. Like, do we want to apply it to every single resource in the, or every single time this happens in the entire cluster? Probably not. So what, we, what needs to happen with a validating emission policy, it also needs to have a binding. So this is a validating emission policy binding, which says if the label environment is set to test, then we want to use that policy that we just defined. So easy, well, we'll say it's straightforward at least, right? Does it work? Eh. <laughs> so um, to go more into eh, let's talk about what is an application in Kubernetes. So Victor's at the helm. Will you run okay. these commands, please, yes, friends? Yes, I can. I can. I'm perfectly capable to copy something. <laughs> Look at me doing it and run it in a terminal. Yes. There we go. I'm Excellent. very good at it. So we're at <laughs> I can copy even more than one command <laughs> for all of you interested. So we're creating an application in Kubernetes, and now we want to see all of these resources. So all of these resources, when you create just a vanilla application in Kubernetes, you're getting a stateful set, replica set, deployment, um, we're get, getting pods that we talked about, services, all of these things. So do we need to create an admission policy for every single one of these resources? I mean, it's pretty tedious. It's doable, but tedious. And then we take it back to our slides. Okay, great. Thanks. Oh, now, now there's a command to delete it. There you go. Okay, doable, but tedious. So here we have our person. They want to create all these things, and, um, and they need to make a policy for every single one. So that's like, okay. But what, what happens when you want to add custom resources? Maybe you're using Argo CD for GitOps, and that's going to add custom resources. Maybe you're using Knative because you want your application to be able to scale to zero. Well, now you have more resources you're adding associated with Knative. Maybe you want Crossplane. I don't know why you'd want Crossplane. Me neither. <laughs> Maybe you want Crossplane because you're, you're um, managing resources that are e external to Kubernetes, and you're using, managing them through Kubernetes with Crossplane and you're gonna create custom resources there. So now if we're getting the CRDs that are uh, with our application, now look how many we have, hundreds, 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 and if you have more applications, thousands, there's so many. Are you meant to write a Kubernetes validating admission policy for every one of these? Now, now we're getting out of the realm of this isn't realistic. It's not only tedious, but in, in managing, making sure they're up to date, it's not a good idea. So that's the number. What's one reason why it should you be doing it is, eh. but the second reason, oh, here's an illustration of, of having to manage all of that. And it's great to have, I do like that you're managing everything through the control plane, even external resources. You have one place where everything is managed, but doing it as on a resource by resource base isn't realistic. So another reason why this is difficult is that uh, Kubernetes doesn't have a concept of an application. There's not a way to link these resources together. So we're in our example, here's another very similar um, uh, validating admission policy. So very similarly, we're going to create and update things, um, a deployments or stateful sets. If that happens, then we have our rule, a replica must be less than or equal to five, and then it's going to pass. But what if our replica set isn't defined in our deployment? What if it's defined in our HPA? 
So maybe we, ap we apply a deployment that has zero replicas and it, it matches this so it goes through. And then slowly, our, as more and more traffic comes to our application, it scales, days, months, weeks pass, and finally we're, we're hitting our upper limit of five replicas. And then it starts to fail. And the failure, this is failing, and that message is actually going to the HPA, which is doing the job of scaling it. And then it's like, well, then your application is breaking and you don't know why. So because you can define your application maybe on your HPA, maybe you're using Keta, or maybe you're defining your replicas here, then it's not a good idea because there's not a way to tell Kubernetes, um, to give Kubernetes the context of the whole application. So what should we do? Victor, come uh, in and save the day. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is happening more and more often is uh, people creating custom resource definitions, right? Creating uh, uh, schemas or uh, definitions that are at the right abstraction level of the people using it, right? So if, you need, if you're a developer, right? Most of you here are very ex extremely familiar with Kubernetes and similar things. But if you're a developer, you want to have the right abstraction level and to say, this is how I define my application, right? I have something called application. I have something called database. And then all the low level resources are being created by controllers in Kubernetes cluster that do things, right? And you, we do get those custom resource definitions either by installing third-party applications, like those that Whitney mentioned, uh, Knative, for example, is a great example of how you can create the right level of abstraction to define what something is, in case of Knative serverless application, typically, and then the low-level details are created by controller of that uh, resource. Now, that's one way to go, right? And you're almost certainly going to do it through third-party applications, or you're going to create your own definitions of what something means in your organization. So here is a silly example. Uh, I, I defined a custom resource definition uh, called upclaim uh, that enables people in a company to define applications at the right level, at the level that they understand what it is. And in this case, it's just a couple of parameters that say, hey, this is going to run in production, this is the image, this is the port, this is the host, go, right? Uh, and behind the scenes, the controller will do the heavy lifting of creating ingress or services or virtual services or whatever else is required for such an application to run. Now, that's the simplification part that is unrelated with the policies we talked so far, right? How can we simplify lives of somebody? But it is also related uh, to to policies for two reasons, because all of a sudden developer or somebody who, is, who wants to have something is working on that abstraction level, uh, not really interested in the low level details, and that's the place where we can apply policies. Because if you apply policies for something called, in this case, example application, we have the context, right? Because that's the level of abstraction that creates all those low level details. We know that there will be a deployment, an ingress and service, HPA, whatever else there will be. We, we know what we have instead of uh, having a potential mishmash of different resources. So I'm going to use Crossplane to show you this in action. And I'm using Crossplane mostly because I'm very, very familiar with Crossplane. Uh, and you can accomplish the same thing with many other ways, right? You can create your own controllers with MetaController. You can use Cluster API. Uh, you can... Um, you can use Kubevela, for example. So many, many different technologies. It's not about cross-plane, but more about figuring how to do that. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to simulate uh, that, I'm, uh, that I'm a developer, and uh, I, want to create, uh, I want to create a database, right? So, and to create a database, you need to figure out what's your provider. Is it Google, AWS, Azure? Do you have VPC, subnets, whatever you have, right? Uh, but I already have a specific. I already have a CRD for that, uh, so I'm going to just say. By the way, I'm going to use kubectl. Never, ever, 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 ever do this in production yourself. Use Argo CD or Flux, please. Uh, this is only for demo purposes. Uh, don't say in public that Victor deploys to production. Like this. Anyways, uh, SQL, uh, AWS official, right? Uh, here I have one definition. I created the database, right? 
Uh, I created a secret as well, unrelated with this talk. I created something called SQL Claim. That's very easy for me. Make it bigger. Make it bigger. Mm. There we go. <laughs> Is it big enough? Yes. OK, cool, cool. <laughs> Complain. Um, so this is what I got, right? By creating that single resource, I got this, which is, uh, you know, all the typical AWS stuff that nobody understands, but everybody has to use. Like, uh, I created an instance of a database, a database server, or I will create it soon. There is a database there, security group rules, security groups, uh, route table associations, and so on and so forth, right? This is what the controller created behind the scenes, not something I created directly. Now, uh, what... Uh, <coughs> what really does matter is that if I would try to create policies for all of those resources and hundreds of hours, the, uh, others, that would be a disaster. Uh, so what we are doing is what I just did is essentially slightly different. Instead of creating all those resources separately, I said, hey, you cannot do any of those things. You can create something called SQL. That will create all those resources, and those resources will create stuff in, uh, in AWS. Now, the important part here is for me to show you how, that, uh, how all that works, and then I'm going to go back to, uh, to the subject of policies because that's, a, that's the subject of this talk, right? So I created something called SQL Claim. I use labels to say, to define what, which in our, we call it compositions, but you can call it otherwise, uh, that I want to use AWS, I want Postgres database, I want some parameters like version f uh, 13, uh, size small, because I have no idea what sizes AWS have, but the designer of this uh, composition did, did include that part as well. So, um, what I'm going to do now is to define... Um, you remember all those resources that were created behind, right? I'm trying to skip creation of policies for all those and concentrate only on the ones that uh, people can, uh, can instantiate. In this case, I'm saying, hey, I want to have a policy that says uh, object called uh, SQL claims or SQLs, uh, if it has f uh, spec parameter size matches small, medium, large, uh, then you're fine. If it has anything other than those three sizes, not good, you will fail, right? Uh, I bound it to all environments, effectively. And then I have another policy that says, and by the way, those policies are introduced in Kubernetes 126. This is available. It's actually not available because it's still alpha, but you can enable it in Kubernetes, by the way. And another policy that says, hey, uh, this one allows only medium and large uh, sizes uh, for your database servers. <coughs> and the version of your uh, SQL must be one and then followed by three or four dot whatever, right? Effectively, versions 13, uh, 13 and 14. And then what I'm doing here is saying, hey, but this, this first policy that says it can be any of the three sizes that, that is applied anywhere, but the second policy that restricts specific versions of the database and uh, the specific sizes for the database server are applied only if the namespace has the label environment set to production, effectively to only to production environments, right? And with, of course, I would have other policies but what matters here is that I can concentrate when creating policies only on the user interface effectively instead of all the resources that are managed by my Kubernetes cluster, greatly simplifying uh, my life and other people's lives. Um, so uh, let me apply that one, copy-paste, and then uh, if I deploy the same resources before, uh, this is the same database like what I, um, what I applied earlier, the one that worked, but this time I'm setting it to the namespace production too. That's the only difference between what I did before and what I'm doing right now, and the output becomes thou shall not pass, meaning the, the size must be one of medium large. This definition, which I can show you, by the way, uh, this definition says 
I want to use a small database, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that policies are baked in, admission controllers are baked into Kubernetes. You have a bunch of tools, and now you have even some implementation of the policy engine baked into Kubernetes. The piece missing over there is that if you try to define policies for everything that your Kubernetes cluster can do, you are probably extremely, extremely young. <laughs> because there's so many years left until retirement, and you will have enough time, maybe, to finish it. Uh, that's our very, very short talk. We like to keep it, I like to keep it short, so that we have a lot of time for questions. Go. <laughs> Nothing. If, if you want to ask, uh, you have a privilege to, to catch the microphone. <laughs> So why? why? Why are you doing this? I mean, what, 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 to tell me just kind of in just summarize, summarizing why is this relevant right now? Is it, why, why is it relevant to use policies or? Why, why is it what you're proposing relevant? Or why is it what you're talking about relevant right now to people who are out here just trying to, I, I see what you're doing, but I'm trying to understand what's, what, what it is you're trying to bring forward. What are you trying to, you know, provide here? So what I'm, there are a couple of things, right? Uh, first, that the, the only place that is reasonable from my perspective to create some kind of validation is on a server side, right? Traditionally, what we were doing in the past is, hey, you have some scripts running in CI/CD pipelines or something like that that will validate that what you want to do is something that you can do, which was always a horrible idea for a simple reason, because if you try to do validation somewhere on a client side, that means that you need to always go through all the tooling, all the places where that validation can be executed, right? Once we move that validation into the cluster, we have a one place where we define what can and what cannot be done, right? Instead of chasing all the different places, oh, can you execute it from your laptop? Yes, that's where I need to force you to use this script, right? Can you execute it from pipeline? Yes, we need to force you to execute this validation over there, right? So first step, moving validations that something is acceptable into Kubernetes, which Kubernetes itself gives us all the tooling, or at least uh, gives us the webhooks called admission controllers that will trigger processes that validate something. And now we have, um, we have the implementation of those webhooks apart from third-party tools like Averno, OPA, Gatekeeper, baked into Kubernetes, right? But once you start to do that, once you put validations in the right place, uh, you're faced with the sheer volume of all the types of resources that might need validations, right? Uh, because Kubernetes resources tend to be very, very low level, meaning uh, there is no such thing as application in Kubernetes. It doesn't exist, right? Uh, so you need to create those obstructions, first of all, to simplify the exp user experience, because no Node.js developer really wants to deal with deployment stateful sets, uh, services, virtual services, ingresses, and what's or not. Second, more important for this talk, because, because once you create those right level of abstractions and, and deny access to the low level resources, you have remote chance to define policies that actually do make sense. Does that answer your question? Good enough for me. Okay. <laughs> So, is on? Yeah. Uh, so you said that this, these these policies should be available in 126. So I'm curious uh, if we enabled it now, what are some of the rough edges to look out for if you wanted to use this in uh, production? So uh, Kubernetes community project changed uh, the way how things are done in terms that in the past we were having anything starting from alpha versions baked into Kubernetes core, right? Now the Afterwards, it changed. Okay, once it reaches beta, it comes into Kubernetes. Now it's once it reaches V1, it goes into Kubernetes. That means that now we are in alpha stage with 
uh, admission policies, the implementation uh, in Kubernetes means that it is not baked into Kubernetes yet. You need to enable alpha feature. Now, depending on which Kubernetes provider you're using, that's one way to do it or no, or you cannot do it at all. Um, now, the major problem, from what I've seen, there are no major issues uh, in terms of how it works uh, that I know. Uh, the major issue is that there is a strong chance that the API will change, mm -hmm. right? That's on one hand. So if you would start using it right now, you might need to rewrite part of your things. Uh, on the other hand, if you already have policies, great. Use whichever policies you have. On the other hand, if you don't have policies right now, if you would be starting implementing policies today for your cluster, then you would be in a tricky situation because you have to make a choice. Will you use something that is going to be baked into Kubernetes and that is going to be standard? Or, but it's not production ready? Or will you use something that is production ready, but is likely going to be replaced fully mm -hmm. by the API, not necessarily implementation that is now available, which is yeah. baked into Kubernetes. So if you start today, let's say that you use Caverno, I mean, if you already use Caverno, Caverno is amazing, great, right? But if you would be starting today, will you write all your policies in a syntax that is likely going to disappear? Mm -hmm. Tough question, right? Or you use something that is not ready for production, even though you have production-ready options available. Yeah. Right. Uh, what is, I cannot share much, but I, I, I know that uh, at least one of the major policy providers right now, without naming them, is likely going to rewrite their engine to use the, the standard. Call it standard, right? See, I, I feel that something on a much smaller scale will be happening with policies as what is happening with observability, that now everybody is going in a direction, okay, so I do need to support uh, open telemetry no matter what I had in the past and what my format was. I expect the same thing will happen with policies. And that means that OPA, anybody likes Rego? Okay. <laughs> then you're going to have a hard time. <laughs> when kind of like, that's unre unrewritable to, to this. Sorry. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> there you go. So, so how is this going to change the developer's experience? What's going to, or not at all? So depends. Uh, uh, if the question goes to our CRDs or policies, or both? Both. I mean, I mean, the developer, I mean, it's going to be transparent, I'm assuming, right? Or yeah, what's going to so, change? Uh, CRDs themselves, I think, are transforming developer experience to be much better simply because uh, what we have in Kubernetes and what we have in cloud providers, from my perspective, is too low level. It's not the right level of abstraction. Find me a developer who understands how to create an EKS cluster. Because those of you not familiar with EKS cluster, all you have to do is to create an EKS cluster uh, nodes, uh, internet gateway, subnets, VPCs, uh, madness, right? It's not the right level of abstraction. So CRDs are going to simplify that and allow developers to do something that is tailor-made for their needs. Now, policies are also simplifying because Actually, it depends how you look at it, right? I see policies, first of all, as implementation of good practices. You get immediate feedback. This is okay. This is not okay. I'm very much against forcing people to read some wiki page that will tell them, execute this script, and then that script will tell you whether that's okay or no. Uh, this is very straightforward. You have a development cluster. You want to push something there. It tells you, no, this is wrong, right? Uh, it gives immediate feedback, and that's a good thing, I believe. I mean, how does this differ from OPA? OPA? I know it's uh, so uh, in a practical sense, it's not different from uh, no, sorry. End user experience is not different, right? Somebody defined policies, right? Uh, you try to apply something and the policies return to you with saying no way, right? Now, from the designer perspective, from somebody who designs policies, uh, there is that same question that I was asking before. Okay, so if there is something baked into Kubernetes as a standard, does it make sense for you to use that or to use some third party, very specific solution? Doesn't matter whether it's OPA or something else. I have a slight beef with OPA uh, when within Kubernetes. I think that it's 
it could do better being more cube native and playing nicely with other tools, but that's my personal beef. From the end user perspective, it's the same. You get the feedback whether that's something okay or no. Okay, thanks. I have one minute left. They tell me. Anybody else? Last question. Yeah, yell, yell. I cannot speak for Caverno, I promised. Uh, but if you see them in a the KubeCon, they'll probably maybe be open to tell you about the plans. Uh, so Caverno, I, but let's put it this way, right? Uh, tools like Caverno that are, so um, the validation policies that are now in Kubernetes are basically a declarative way to define policies with exception of having expression field that is using cell, uh, which I don't know what it's short Common for. Common expression language. Uh, <laughs> uh, right, and it would be relatively straightforward to transform syntax of something like Caverno into that. It's different YAML, essentially, right? And Caverno also has something similar to cell. Uh, so it's likely going to happen. And it will really depend on the pressure that comes. Uh, if something similar to uh, open telemetry happens, in meaning that the, the users start pressuring vendors that, hey, I like what you have, but you, I want you to compete on top of this instead of being completely separate, and we'll, we'll get it, yeah. Uh, I would ask anybody else, but uh, I will be kicked out of the stage. <laughs> she will not be kicked out. They like her, but I will. So <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, see you around. Thanks.